see the scope and the size based on how Monte Cusla is standing. There's a pond right over here. Still some water. And then we look back towards the hall. Sukitatanaparu parang nikubhet nati manjet kat chinang kanchi biaro sana nanya manya seduk micheya mata yathan yang putang ayusai keput manurakhe wampi sab bhutesu Aparimanang mitanche sabbalokas ming manasang bhavaye aparimanang uddang adoche tiriyanche asambadhang. Siyavidure bhuta vakitatta na paru parang nikubhet nati manyet kat chinang kanchi biaro sana. Nanya manya sedukha micheya mata yathan yang puttang ayusai ke putt manurakhe vampi sabh bhutesu. So for the meditators, um, if you want to offer something to go in the stupa, there is a bowl of crystals. If you can, you can take a crystal. We're giving those crystal. Antra, Mark Berger will give you those crystals. And you can offer them into the sutta, uh, into the stupa, <laughs> uh, when Bhantikusla gives us the word. Okay, so 
Um, I guess we should just go ahead and get started. Welcome to Dhammasukha Meditation Center here in Annapolis, Missouri. And it's about 10 a.m. now, and uh, I want to welcome you to this um, blessing and memorial service for Bhante Vimala Ramsey and Usi Lananda. I think everybody knows who Bhante is. Well, maybe you don't know who I am. So my name is David Johnson, and I was Bhante's attendant uh, from 2010 onward. And especially it's been interesting in the last few years as his health declined. But uh, I, I've been a um, supporter of TWIM since 2007, after many years of doing Vipassana. He founded uh, this uh, center with Sister Kema, who passed away just around 48 hours ago. So Venerable Sister Kema is also no longer with us, and they're doing a memorial for her in India, um, actually right now, so almost at the same time. And she uh, helped to found Dhammasukha. Uh, she was the administrative push behind Bonte to get all of these things set up. And so we owe a debt of gratitude to her. And as well, she got a very big uh, inheritance, nearly a quarter of a million dollars from one of her relatives. And she gave that all, all that money to, to the center here. And that's why the the dining hall and the kitchen and the landscaping and many of these things exist because of of that donation that that she did trying different things and uh, experimenting and seeing you know the kind of results that that he that he could get with his mind and sharing that with us and so we uh, we felt that uh, his teaching was incredibly effective when it when people started falling into the stream Okay. Well, Bhante Bimala Ramsey was a giant presence in our lives. Um, we had, as Mark said, we had been doing Vipassana meditation uh, since 1975. And um, we... Uh, knew Bhante from that time. And then he had many travels um, up to San Francisco, um, then to Asia, and then he came back from Asia in 1998. So um, the first retreat was with five people, four adults, and one fetus. And uh, at that time, we were um, introduced to metta meditation and the Brahma Viharas and the six R's. At that time, the six R's were brought forth. I'm closer. Uh, hi. <laughs> I'm Drew Litchie. I uh, am proud to call Bonte my teacher, um, my mentor, and amazingly my friend. I met him in 2006 in person. Um, before that, we had corresponded by email and I'd done an online retreat with him and sister. That retreat was supposed to be eight days and it went on to 13 or 14 days. We were all having a lot of fun. Um, and then finally, I came down to the center to meet him in person. I'd like to tell you a little bit about what that was like here. We're in a, a very luxurious meditation center right now. I don't think you've noticed any chiggers or uh, any spiders hanging from the trees. Uh, when I came here in 2006, there was no GPS available. Uh, and many of us who came then, we had to use paper maps and find our way. And, and I got lost. I got lost in Farmington and went the wrong direction. And I had to call with a payphone to get here. Uh, and, and call sister on the payphone, and she answered the phone. Um, part of getting here in the early days was was actually getting here. The the challenge of, of getting and being here was something. Uh, so when we when you arrived here, there was the A frame. There was two trailers, and then there was a small, uh, simply the the log cabin where we do the interviews now. That is all that was here. 
there was some roads, there was no light up top here. And we all lived and worked uh, in the A-frame or, or there. At that time, at uh, first retreat, it was myself, sister, Bonte, and another, uh, another man named Michael. In the first couple of years, it was like that. And so retreats here were different. You'd wake up in the morning and wait in line for the single bathroom. And then we would all sit together in the Dhamma Hall. Um, and sitting with Bonte in those days was spectacular. He would sit in his red chair, smiling, silent, unmoving, uh, really inspirational. And learning from that was a, was a big part of the early training, simply being around Bonte. Uh, we would get up for breakfast around seven and Bonte would, be, would go till 8.30, 9.30, whatever he felt like. And came out and have his uh, everything bagel with cream cheese and coffee every single morning. That's, that's what happened. And, and yogi jobs in those days were, uh, they were work. Uh, we were clearing land. My first yogi job was building a roof on the back of the A-frame. The first yogi job was building a roof. So mowing lawns, tilling the ground, carrying uh, logs and sawing. It was, it was real. A little bit of weeding and sweeping the tile floor. It's a little different. You know. And then we all made lunch together. Or I should I say sister made us lunch in a very small kitchen uh, where only her and maybe one other person possibly could help. And we all, all ate lunch together around a single table in the A-frame. And I have to say there was no, no silence on those retreats. Uh, we were all talking and discussing the Dhamma, discussing our practice and everything, this and that. And that was actually a very important part of, of those days is how small of a community it was. Uh, Bonte was always available. Um, you could just walk and knock on his door and he would be happy to answer and talk with you whenever you had a question. When we had, uh, when we had interviews, there was no space. So we all did the interviews together in the meditation hall. And so we all knew what was happening with all of us. Um, and that was also incredibly valuable um, to hear how the process went with everyone. Um, so when I think about those times, I, I, an important part of Bante uh, and how he was is he was human and he maintained being as human and being as connected uh, to you as a person as possible. He was one who could rally great authority uh, and yep, he could admonish very well. But he, the authority came from his robes, from the Buddhist teaching. It came not from, uh, not from any kind of personal specialness. And he made sure to be as human as possible with you. And, you know, you knew, you knew what his, he was like as a person. And that's why you respected him from what he taught and how he was. And that's something I'll always take from him. The importance of connection with people. Good morning, Bante. Good morning, brothers and sisters in Dhamma. Uh, my name is Brenda and this is Scott, my husband. And... We knew Bante in 2008 from Mark and Antra in San Diego. We used to live in San Diego and um, we learned from Tan Jeff uh, uh, in the class. And they mentioned to us that there is this monk who is teaching from the Sutta. And at the time, I never knew a monk reading Suttas. So in, with my limited um, uh, knowledge at the time, so we met him in 2008 in one of the one-day retreat in Laguna Beach. And when I saw him reading the sutta, I knew he is my teacher. And I told him, I found my home at the time. With tears in With eyes. tears in my eyes. And then because, as you see, I look purple. And if you remember, Sister Kemas in the beginning, she wore purple robes and that just got me into, I want to be like her. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, we learned, we went to a retreat in Joshua Tree in 2009. And then before we went back to Indonesia for good, uh, we came to the center, which as Drew mentioned, that it was only an A-frame building and we 
I stayed in a kuti and he stayed in a different kuti and one of the trees what were was uprooted. It was like this as we come back in 2023. I made it many times in the past with Vipassana. And I would do a 10 day or seven or uh, seven days retreat with other teachers, of course, in Indonesia. And I didn't have personality change. Um, after two or three weeks, I would go back to the same spitfire as I was before. So my mom would be asking, why are you spending this much time on retreats, wasting time, wasting money? And then I said, well, this kind of helped me to be more focused up until we met Bante. And we, back, we were back to Indonesia in 2009, and my mom saw me different. I wasn't as spitfire as before. Okay. Thank you all for being here. This is such an amazing experience to share this with everyone. And uh, it's so special also um, that um, Sister Kema, we think, joined with joined Bonte. They were so closely connected. And um, we know shortly after Bonte got sick, then Sister Kema also started to become ill. And um, um, they were definitely a team and connected with one another. And it feels really special and powerful to be here and be a part of this. So um, what I want to say is that um, Bante helped to show me the power of forgiveness. And uh, that when you forgive, actually miracles happen. It might sound extreme, but it really, it's exactly like that. Um, Bante had like, when I first met with him, it's like he had one foot in another realm, in a magical realm. And I think I had really lost the belief in all of that when I came here. I was, uh, this was in 2015. And uh, he brought back um, the magic for me and uh, the belief that um, really special things can happen. Yeah. Please pass this on. others <clears throat> so um, if you are wondering what the stupa represents uh, you can look at it now you see there is a base that is symbolizing faith and you see three rings above this base that represents the triple gem and then the dome where we put the relics. Um, this dome represents the seven factors of awakening, all the teachings of the Buddha. And then the square shaped one on top represents the four noble truths. And the one above also is in square shape. It can take also the round shape. It is where the heavenly beings enter and uh, worship, uh, show respect, make offerings to the relics. So usually in Sri Lankan stupas, you will see statues of devas in that chamber. And I have seen this myself uh, in Sri Lankan uh, large stupa called uh, Swarnamali stupa in Anuradhapura. You see these lights coming out from it, um, early morning hours in the day. And it's amazing to see, and it makes you wonder, this must be heavenly beings visiting the relics of the Buddha. And there's a spiral that goes up, um, and that usually represents the eightfold path that you all are practicing. And what is on top uh, is Nibbana. Nibbana came from Indonesia. <laughs> Sister Brenda brought it all the way from Indonesia. So we have it from uh, yesterday. Um, as we will be chanting, um, you can, well, you are holding the thread. Maybe we'll finish the chanting first, um, and then um, you will be picking a relic or some offering from the table here. And uh, if you like to remove your shoes, you may do so over there. That's why I left if those shoes or uh, slippers over there. And there's a carpet came from Nepal. 
she brought it i don't know her name she brought it from nepal uh, and it perfectly fits this uh, space here um, and then you can place whatever you want to offer it can be jewelry uh, uh, statues uh, anything gold silver crystals whatever you can get from here and place it in that relics chamber and it'll be covered and completely plastered uh, later so no one has access to what you are offering so um i will also i uh, well we happen to be here when sister kema passed away as, as well uh, and uh, the universe is somehow telling us that we should continue the dhamma service as best as we can 